I can't see that. Thank you, thank you. I've had the pleasure to introduce your next lecturer, your next speaker, Jim Mars. I've known Jim for many, many, many years, and believe me, you're in for a treat. Did that sound like Bob? You know, you're in for a treat. Uh, if Bob was here, he would also say a lot of other things like, shh. But um, if you can all turn off your cell phones. Um, get ready to have your... Uh, well, first of all, I hope everybody's fed because you're going to be here a while and you're going to have to digest everything that Jim Mars is going to tell you. And most of this stuff, a lot of you haven't heard. So let's introduce right now Jim Mars. That's better. All right, let me make sure that uh, everything's going here. Okay. Some months ago when I was contacted by Bob Brown and he invited me to come to the International UFO Congress, I said, oh yeah, great, I always love those people, that's always a great event. I said, what do you want me to talk about? And without any hesitation, he says, I want you to talk about 9-11. And I thought, whoa. So here I am today about 9-11. Now the question I'm sure you're asking yourself is, what has 9-11 got to do with UFOs? Well, let me explain it to you. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> as far as I know at this point. However, there are two things I'd like to mention. Number one, 9-11 is a good entry point for the uninitiated. The facts and information that are now available about 9-11 make the Kennedy assassination look like a deep, dark mystery. It took 40 years for the public to finally come around to understand that there was a conspiracy to kill John Kennedy and that this conspiracy was covered up at the level of the federal government. The polls show, in my experience, is that probably 80, maybe even as high as 90 percent of the country now understand that Kennedy was killed as a result of a conspiracy. Then that means the government lied to us. So once they understand this, then it's not going to be any big leap to look at 9-11 and the such obvious inconsistencies, problems, mysteries, controversies surrounding 9-11. And if they understand that is a government cover-up, that they've lied to us about that, then believe me, they're going to be a lot more open to the idea of the UFO cover-up. Second thing is, as a lot of you already know, when you start getting to, to issues like UFOs, Kennedy assassination, 9-11, you st it starts leading you into the small cabal of men, very few women, but possibly one or two, Hillary Clinton, but uh, <laughs> who, uh, who I call, who they call themselves the globalist. I call them the New World Order people. These are the people who are rapidly pushing us towards a one world government, one world military, one world monetary unit. And uh, once you start looking at that, you realize that UFOs, 9-11, Kennedy assassination, it all traced back to this small handful of people. Before I launch into my presentation, though, I've got a couple of quick announcements. Uh, some good news and an advertisement. <laughs> the advertisement is a shameless plug for my book, The Terra Conspiracy. As you can see, it's just a little bitty tome. It's only about 500 pages, 32 pages of source notes. Folks, this book essentially was written in 2002. 
I had a contract with Harper Collins in New York. It passed the legal vetting. The day after it passed the legal vetting, a vice president at Harper, who by our own admission had not read the book, said, we're going to have to cancel this. And the only explanation that was ever given was that they didn't want to upset the families of 9-11 victims. Well, excuse me, wasn't it the families of 9-11 victims that have pushed and pushed and pushed to find out the truth? They were the ones who were responsible for the 9-11 commission, you know, two years after the fact. And that's something else for you to keep in mind. One day after Pearl Harbor, there was a congressional investigation to find out what happened. Less than a week after the Kennedy assassination, Johnson appointed that late but not lamented Warren Commission. Two years after 9-11, the, the worst attack on American soil ever, President Bush had still not done anything to find out what actually happened there. Incredible, incredible. And the only reason that they finally were forced into convening the 9-11 omission, uh, commission was that the families of the 9-11 victims. The only reason I tell you that is because some people think that I'm just the Johnny come lately, you know, uh, try to follow up because in the interim, various people, David Ray Griffin and Webster Tarpley, Michael Rupert, uh, uh, several others, uh, rushed into print, either self-published or from some small uh, publishing houses, uh, books on 9-11. And they all have significant information to add in there, but I feel like I'm here with the home folks, and I just want you to know I was on it. I was there first. It's not my fault that they keep me suppressed, but now it's available. And this is not only about 9-11, but puts it into the broader context, the war for oil and drugs. The, uh, are you all aware that Afghanistan now has a bumper crop of poppies that source of heroin, and that the Taliban had destroyed about 90% of it. Now, just think about that a minute. We go in and invade and occupy a country where they have just about eradicated the heroin trade, and in the uh, four years that we've been in occupation, now they're having bumper crops. Doesn't that tell you something? Now, on a, on a little bit more positive note, a happier note, Unfortunately, I, I've been so tied up, I didn't think of this in time, but, but uh, Nikki has been very, very gracious. Many of you have heard me speak about the alien ghost in Roswell. Anybody? We, I, as a co-producer, produced what we thought was going to be the first of a series for Discovery Channel called XOPS, and the idea I thought then and still think is extremely good. We got a team of investigators that included a couple of scientific types with all their instruments, an Indian shaman, two psychics or remote viewers, okay, and an experiencer, and a ranking member of MUFON, and that was going to be our team, and we were going to go out and investigate anomalous issues. And we all decided that the first thing that we wanted to go investigate was the alien ghost in Roswell. Was there such a thing? Was this just a story? Is there any way to prove that? I mean, it sounds, I, I'm the first one to admit, it sounds ridiculous. An alien ghost in Roswell? Come on, you know, I mean, it sounds like something you're going to read in the National Enquirer or something, you know, except I had been there, I had talked to the people at the hospital, and they were all very serious about it. So, at the cost of several hundred thousand dollars, we produced our pilot show of XOPS, The Alien Ghost in Roswell. Then, strange things began to happen in more ways than one. We actually got film of floating orbs. We got instrument reading showing that something was happening there. We got interviews with the people at the hospital. We did satellite imaging and found out that this hospital where they report the alien ghost just happens to be at the exact same location as the old wooden framed hospital 
that was there at Roswell Army Air Force Base in 1947, where according to the stories, aliens were brought and died or were brought there dead to begin with. It was amazing, the things we got on film. We turned this into discovery and then more amazing things happened. The uh, executive in charge, who was our liaison, just basically disappeared. No word of farewell, no, hey, how are you? No, I'm leaving, but so-and-so will be in charge. We had no one to contact. We would go to Discovery. They acted like they didn't know who we were after giving us all this money. And then finally, they just said, no, 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 it's just not up to our standards. And they just canceled the whole thing. And that was the end of that. Well, Friday, this Friday, the lunch period runs from 12.55 to 2.15. They have graciously given me time, I suppose, here. At 1.30 p.m. Friday, you can see the alien ghost in Roswell. You can see our segment of... And you can see for yourself if this is a bogus show, if it's just sensational and there's really nothing there. So I invite you to come here 1.30 Friday and decide for yourself whether we actually got onto something or if we were just, you know, horsing around and, and had nothing to do. If we'll go to the slides now, unfortunately the, the size of this lops off the tag at the bottom. You notice you've got a helmeted figure with a blindfold on a book. It said, knowledge Right, it says, reading is terrorism. <laughs> don't learn, don't learn. And this is actually very apropos because on the case of 9-11, the only way that you cannot understand that 9-11 was an inside job is to not look at the evidence. And this is what the mainstream media would have you do. You probably, some of you who've kept up with this are probably well aware that Popular Mechanics issued a whole big issue talking about debunking the 9-11 myths. And let me clue you in on something. A few months before that issue came out, there was a big house cleaning at Popular Mechanics, and people who'd been there for years were fired or moved on or demoted or moved aside, and they put in a whole new crew headed by Benjamin Chertoff, who is their chief research consultant, and then they come out with this whole big spread, debunking 9-11 myths. And of course, that comes out through popular mechanics. It's got to be right. But let me tell you about Benjamin Chertoff. Does that name ring a bell to anybody? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was contacted by a reporter and said, say, are you in any relation to Michael Chertoff, the head of Homeland Security? And Benjamin Chertoff says, oh, well, uh, no, I, I, really, I don't know. I don't think so. So this enterprising reporter calls Benjamin Chertoff's mother <laughs> and asks her, are you all related to Michael Chertoff? And she, unhesitantly, she says, oh, yeah, he's our cousin. So, yeah, you can see the honesty that you get from those publications. A little later, because there was a big ho-hum about their first article, they felt like they had to come out with a second article. And on this one, they got none other than Senator John McCain to write a big piece in there, you know. Now, let me tell you folks, I mean, those of you who know me, you know, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a liberal, I'm not a conservative, I'm an American, okay? And as such, I thought, wow, Jennifer, uh, Senator John McCain. I said, I better pay attention to this. Maybe there's something I don't know. Maybe he has some information that I haven't found. So I read his article very, very closely because I wanted to know if there was some myth that I was propagating that I want to be set straight. And folks, he didn't tell us one damn thing. All he did was attack conspiracy theorists. Well, John, that's great, but uh, tell me some facts that contradict what the conspiracy theorists are saying. In fact, what I say is, it's not a conspiracy theory if you can prove it, right? So, the next question is, why is it important? And, and what I'm giving you right now is 9-11-101. I'm going to hit the high points. We're not going to talk about bulges on the airplanes. We're not going to talk about the melting point of steel and all of these intricate issues that most people just 
get glazed over and they go, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to hit you with some pertinent information that should lead any thinking person to the realization that 9-11 was an inside job. The best light you can put on it is that certain people in high office knew that we were going to be attacked, and they allowed these attacks to take place to further their political agenda. Now, if that sounds very strange to you, very un-American to you, very fantastic to you, then just consider Pearl Harbor. It is now beyond question that Franklin Roosevelt, George Marshall, his chief of staff, handful of others knew that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked. And they knew when, and they knew exactly what was going to happen. But as Roosevelt told Churchill, you know, this actually may help our agenda, which was to get an angry and unified America into World War II. Now, I'm not here to argue the merits of that. I can see both sides. I can even see that there's a very good argument that Roosevelt, by this point, who had been elected to an unprecedented fourth term on the pledge and promise that he would keep us out of war, realized that we were going to have to get in this war, and sooner would be better than later, and that this was a necessary step. I can see that argument. That's not what we're questioning. The point is they allowed 3,000 Americans to be killed at Pearl Harbor when they could have prevented it to further their political agenda. And we see the same thing going on in 9-11. I might also mention the Gulf of Tonkin, which got us into Vietnam big time. Supposedly, North Vietnamese gunboats attacked some of our ships in the Sixth Fleet in the Gulf of Tonkin, and President Johnson rushed into Congress and said, quote, our boys are floating in the water. You've got to give me the means to respond to this provocation, and uh, we can't go through the niceties of following the Constitution, which says only Congress can declare war. And a stampeded Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which abrogated the Constitution of the United States, gave war powers to Lyndon Johnson, and we went into the real shooting Vietnam War that cost 58,000 American lives, wrecked our economy, and split whole generations of people. It didn't happen. It simply didn't happen. Even U.S. News and World Report a few years ago had a big article called The Phantom battle that led to war. What happened was basically was that a CIA radio post, listening post, radioed the Sixth Fleet and told them, you're under attack. And so they went to full general quarters and everybody was on edge and they're jumping and they're jittery. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the Sixth Fleet, was a secret plan called Opland 45 where we, CIA was using gunboats to raid the North Vietnamese coast. And of course, when they'd raid the coast, the North Vietnamese shore batteries would fire on them. So the sailors in the Sixth Fleet, who have already been put on edge by a CIA message saying, you're under attack, and they see guns firing on the shore, so they return fire. And this firing went on for some time. And when the smoke had cleared, not one American sailor had been injured or, or killed and not one American ship had been damaged. And in fact, uh, you'll find in my book, Rule by Secrecy, a quote from the uh, Navy uh, aircraft commander who was sent up in search of these North Vietnamese gunboats, and he said, we flew around for hours and never found a one. It didn't happen. So would American leader, uh, leaders uh, put American lives in danger, kill innocent Americans to further their own political agenda? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. So now, when you talk to your friends and neighbors, another argument you're going to get is, well, they wouldn't do something like that. Well, yeah, they would. Another argument you're going to get is, well, that was six years ago. It's kind of ancient history. Why should we be concerned about 9-11? Well, we're at war in Afghanistan. And by the way, if you hadn't kept up with the news, we're losing we're at war in Iraq, 
Again, we're losing. Baghdad is more and more beginning to look like Stalingrad. Okay? And of course, we all know that we have curtailed liberties at home. Having just made three airplane flights to go to another conference and then to here, I just chew my mustache. <laughs> here are people who 20 years ago I wouldn't have considered allowing carrying my bag, and they have power over my life and freedom. And if you try to say something as a free American, they can at best hold you up for hours, make you miss your flight, strip you down, treat you, you know, like a criminal, and at worst, they can uh, arrest you. It's incredible. How did we get to this? 9-11. That's how. Just recently, back in the fall, they actually did a poll of our fighting forces in Iraq. 85% of them said they're over there fighting in retaliation for 9-11 even though President Bush on more than one occasion has publicly admitted that Saddam Hussein Iraq had nothing whatsoever to do with 9-11. That's incredible, isn't it? Oh, well, it was all Osama bin Laden's fault then, wasn't it? Well, then how come the FBI does not have wanted posters out for Osama bin Laden in connection with 9-11? You'll find that he is on the FBI's wanted list, but he's wanted for attacks in uh, other places in the Middle East, okay, and the, the bombing of the Kobar Towers, no mention of 9-11. And when this was called to the attention of the FBI, an FBI spokesman actually told us the truth. He said, well, we have no hard evidence that Osama bin Laden was involved with 9-11. And that, my dear friends, is the truth. So what in the world is going on? Why is this country sliding into martial law, stripping of our liberties, raping the Constitution, fighting abroad? And if you think the war on terror is real, then just consider this. Why are we supposed to be so fearful and concerned about this international terrorist group, Al-Qaeda, who are trying to slip terrorists into our country? and who may even be trying to slip weapons of mass destruction into our country, why are we supposed to believe this is real when they won't even secure the borders? Right. And don't think it can't be done. In the hours following the Kennedy assassination, when Lyndon Johnson was trying to say this could be at the start of a communist attack, bam, they closed the borders. They closed the Mexican border. They closed the Canadian borders. Nobody got in. Nobody got out. It can be done. But here we are six years on, and they're talking about maybe building a wall 700 miles long. Of course, the border is more than 1,000 miles long. That's kind of like putting a big chain link fence three quarters around your house and feeling you're safe. But actually, I think the, the whole thing on the wall is, I saw a great cartoon. It showed them building this big wall, and it had a big sign. It said, United States Security Fence, 20 foot high. And right in front of it was a little shack, big sign out front. It said, coming soon, 22 foot high ladders. <laughs> By the way, the reason that I always try to keep things on as light a note as I can, is uh, it was called to my attention by, and I forget who said this, but it's very true. When you try to tell somebody the truth, say it with humor, otherwise they'll kill you. <laughs> it all started with 9-11, so let's take a look and see exactly what happened on 9-11. First off, we have a conspiracy theory. This conspiracy theory is that 19 suicidal Muslims armed with little box cutters, blades, or little pocket knives somehow successfully hijacked four commercial airliners and somehow miraculously turned off their transponders at just about the same moment and then, with little or no flying experience, managed to maneuver these jumbo jets into three prominent structures 
defeating our $400 billion air defense system, all the while under the command of a Muslim cleric using a laptop computer in a cave in Afghanistan. Now, folks, I've dealt with conspiracy theories for years, and I have to say that's the worst one I've ever heard. But you know what? Don't laugh. That's what you're expected to believe. You're supposed to believe that. That's the official word. And the reason I call it a conspiracy theory is because where's the evidence? It's not there. There's nothing to prove that that theory is correct. It's just absolutely amazing. Now, here are the 19 hijackers. We've seen their pictures, and lit, starting with Mohammed Atta and all these other unpronounceable people. And so, well, there they are. The only problem is seven of these identified hijackers are still alive, walking around the Middle East. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the hijackers are alive. I'm saying the identities that we've been given belong to people who are still alive in the Middle East. Even the head of the FBI, a few days after 9-11, admitted that since they used phony passports and false visas and phony papers, that they really weren't sure who they were. And yet, we're given these pictures and names, and they say, that's them. And even when these seven people have come forward saying it wasn't me, one of them vouched for by the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, their names are still there, and their pictures are still there. These are still the pe people that are etched into your minds as the hijackers, when the reality is we don't know who they were. We have no idea who they were. And I've noticed by several people, several of you who have come up and, and spoken to me, uh, that you have grave doubts about what happened on 9-11. Well, I want to tell you, you're not alone. The latest poll, which I don't have a slide for, was uh, Time uh, Resources, and they showed something in excess of 50 percent, something like 53 percent of the people they polled had severe doubts about the official conspiracy theory. But the one I found absolutely incredible was the September 2006 MSNBC poll. Now, most of these polls, they, the national polls, they usually contact about 1,200, 1,500 people, and they have a plus or minus, you know, 3% one way or another. This one was 67,835 people, almost 68,000 people across this country. And the question was, do you believe any of the conspiracy theories suggesting the U.S. government was somehow involved in 9-11? 60% said yes. That's amazing. So we are actually making quite good progress at this point because those of you in the audience who are at least as old as I am, you remember that six years after the Kennedy assassination, it was not considered polite to even bring it up in public or even talk about it in polite society. And if you did mention it, it was, well, Oswald did it, and that was it. Here we are only six years out from 9-11 uh, and 60% of this, this poll and, and more than 50% of the country does not buy the official story. And here's why. First off, one of the top Al-Qaeda chiefs that we actually caught and got alive was Abu Zabidah who was captured in Pakistan in mid-2002, uh, Ari Flasher, who at that time was the White House press secretary, uh, said he was the top-ranking Al-Qaeda chief that we'd caught to that time, and he says, by golly, we're going to make him talk. And they did. It's an interesting story. They tried torture, but that didn't work on old Abu. He was a tough nut. So they tricked him. They got American special forces uh, soldiers and disguised them as Saudi interrogators. They blindfolded Abu and they flew him around for a while. And they told him they were taking him to a interrogation center in Saudi Arabia. And of course, those folks are not known for their delicate methods. And they figured this would uh, cow him into revealing what he knew. And they landed and they took him to a place he thought he was in Saudi Arabia. They brought these guys in that were posing as Saudi interrogators. And instead of being fearful, 
he showed relief. Boy, am I glad you guys are here. Here's what's going on. And he reveals that he's actually working for three Saudi princes, and he names them. Wherever my pointer is, there we go. Oops, my stubby fingers are terrible. You can, it's barely there, but you can't pronounce them anyway, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so he's actually working for these three Saudi princes, and there's a cutout. His contact is through an air marshal, Mir, of Pakistan, okay? Now, wait a minute. Pakistan is kind of like our ally. We've trained, and the CIA runs Pakistan. We've trained all of their interrogators, all their intelligence people. And, of course, the Saudis are supposed to be our closest friends in the Middle East. And he's actually working for the Saudis through Pakistan? And I ask you folks, I mean, you know, you've read the papers. You've seen some material. Who are the closest business partners and personal friends to the Saudi royals? The Bush family. Hello? This is incredible, folks. And you know, you remember there was a lot of talk about 9-11 could not possibly have been pulled off by a handful of independent terrorists. There had to be a nation state behind them. Well, folks, if there was a nation state, it was Saudi Arabia. 28 pages of the Joint Congressional Committee study in 9-11 dealt with Saudi Arabia, and it was withheld at the request of the Bush administration. Who's covering up? Now, of course, we know about the tax in New York. Most of us were there that morning and were just horrified to see what was going on. And I might mention this. Some of you have studied mind control. You know that in mind control, before you can rebuild someone's personality, first you have to destroy the old one. And the, the best, easiest way to do that is you traumatize them. You traumatize a person, you destroy their willpower, you destroy their ego, their, their own individual uh, personality, and then you can build it back in, in any way you want to. Well, folks, on 9-11, we were traumatized. And in the wake of that trauma, when we were confused and angry and horrified, what did they do? They rushed through the Patriot Act. They rushed through Homeland Security. They invaded Afghanistan. And soon they invaded Iraq. Events that probably none of us would have stood for if we had not been traumatized by the events of 9-11. Now we're told that uh, the, the, those Twin Towers uh, suffered an airplane strike and that their airline, the airplane fuel burst into flame and melted or, or at least distorted some of the steel up there about 80 stories high. And somehow it just caused all these floors to just fall down. But I'd like to point out this picture of the World Trade Center under construction. And you notice it had a core of 47 steel girders interconnected. Early on, they tried to say, well, they were just bolted on, and the bolts popped loose, and it was a zippering effect. It just unzippered, and everything fell down. But then it was found out that they weren't just bolted on. They were welded, okay? So you haven't heard anything much about the zipper effect since then. No, what they give us is the pancake theory. And here we see, well, one floor collapsed, and it hit the other floor, and that collapsed, and then it just kept going on down. And this diagram was out of the 9-11 Commission, and it's deceitful because what appears to be the outer wall, outer wall of the World Trade Center, if you look at the fine print, is actually from here to here. They just totally neglect to tell you about the 47 steel girders in the center of that building. Now, assuming that it's possible for those floors to pancake down Many of you had the old 45 record players, right? And you'd put a stack of records on there, and you had a metal spindle up through the middle, and all the records could collapse down, but that metal spindle still standing there. That's what the World Trade Center would have looked like if those floors had pancaked down, because solid steel that's welded and reinforced together does not just go away. No, instead what we see is what appears to be an explosion. Those are not walls and floors simply collapsing. There is a tremendous explosion going on. And you could see, come back here, my little stubby fingers. 
Come back here. See right here, you can see these, what is called squibs. You can see uh, these explosions at lower floors taking place. This is where they're blowing the support so the whole thing will fall down. If you had gone to the top of one of those towers and tossed off a hammer, it would have taken nine seconds to hit the ground. Those buildings, these huge buildings, glass, steel, concrete, took 10 seconds to hit the ground. Only about one second above free fall speed. How is that possible? Well, it's really not. Although, as I was told by one expert who had been a member of the Academy of Sciences for years, he said, oh, I know all about the Academy of Sciences, which can also be applied to the National Institute of Standard and Practices and all the rest of the federal bureaucracy. He said, you tell me what you want to hear, and I'll share a panel that will give it to you. So, so you're always going to have an expert who will give you some fancy explanation, kind of like the single bullet theory or the jet effect on Kennedy, you know. Yeah, he was actually shot from behind, uh, but it blew out the front of his head, which propelled his head backwards, okay? Of course, the only problem is we have autopsy photographs of his head, and there's no hole in the front of his head, so it doesn't work. Um, and, but we still get all these, but you can see the explosive nature. Now, look at this picture of Ground Zero taken just a day or two later. I have covered at least a half dozen building demolitions. And yes, if they know what they're doing, they can bring a big building down in a matter of seconds. But there's always huge slabs of concrete, big chunks of it. And they have to come in with wrecking balls and break it all up uh, till they get it down small enough to where they can truck it up and haul it off. I ask you, where's the concrete? Where's the big chunks of concrete? It's not there. It's simply not there. And all we see is the metal, and most of this metal is the outer facade, the uh, metal facade. Mainstream media tells us that these 210-story buildings, if they had collapsed down, should have created four and a half million tons of debris that would have been at least 10 stories high. Where is it? It's not there. We only see something that maybe at best is one, two stories high. And the official media again has told us that they carted away one and a half million tons of debris. What happened to the other three million tons of debris? Something is very strange about the collapse of the World Trade Center. And of course, you can see how that they were just reduced to this pulverized dust that covered all of lower Manhattan, but poking right up in the middle there, seemingly unscathed, is the Solomon Building, also known as World Trade Center 7. And folks, the key is Building 7. How many of you knew that there was a third building that collapsed on 9-11? Well, you guys have been doing your homework. Oh, good for you. <laughs> Here, here you can see uh, some meager fires at, at Building 7 that were confined to between the 8th and 13th floors. And that's significant, folks, because what was in those floors? The offices of the Security and Exchange Commission, who has admitted that they lost thousands of prosecution files on Enron and world.com. How convenient. How convenient. So without any significant fires, without being hit by airplanes at 520 that afternoon, watch this. The building just sagged in the middle and dropped straight down. Classic building implosion. In an implosion, they set the explosives in just a certain way so that it doesn't explode, it implodes, and everything falls in on itself so that you don't damage surrounding buildings. I'm going to let this play one more time. This, this, you just can't get away from this. Building 7, 47 stories, stat, glass, steel, and it just drops into its own footprint at free fall speed. Now, I hope you can see this. This is Building 7. This is the debris. And on either side, 
Here is the uh, Verizon building. Here's the U.S. Post Office. And you notice that they're not significantly damaged. But you notice that the debris of Building 7 is all falling inward. Okay? Classic building demolition. Implosion. And that was alluded to by the building owner, Larry Silverstein, who on public television said, well, it's been such a loss of life. And so I told the fire department, pull it. And they pulled it, and we stood there and watched the building come down. Well, pulling it is industry jargon for controlled demolition. Okay? Now, later, years later, after this was floating around, a spokesman for Silverstein Properties comes out and says, well, he was just misinterpreted. Uh, what he meant was, let's pull the fireman out of there. Well, you know, if that's what he meant, why didn't he say that? He didn't say that, okay? But number two, and keep this in mind, all the firemen were pulled out of Building 7 uh, between 10.30 and 11 o'clock that morning. So there weren't any firemen in there to begin with. And why weren't they? Why weren't they putting out fires in Building 7? Obviously, somebody wanted Building 7 to come down. So no planes hit it, only small fires, total collapse at 525, and how's the offices of the Security and Exchange Commission? Now you got the Twin Towers, largest loss of life of firefighters in U.S. history, the largest loss of life in the USA, well, the second largest life. Here's your, here's your pop test question. What was the single worst catastrophe and the largest loss of life in the United States history? All right, somebody said it. Galveston, Galveston, the Galveston flood. 1900, they lost like 9,000 people there, okay? But this is the second loss, largest loss of life in American history, the first and only total collapse supposedly due to fire, and the largest structural collapse in the history of the world. Now, you would think that they would study this for months, maybe years, bring in every expert they could find to find out what caused this? Well, let's not have this happen again. How many of you would go in a high-rise building if you thought that, oh, the fire alarm went off and the building collapses? I mean, and yet, who investigated the loss of the World Trade Centers? Was it the New York Fire Department or the New York Police Department? No. Oh, it must have been the FBI or the CIA. No. It was FEMA. Federal Emergency Management Administration, which at that time answered directly to the President of the United States. And they hired a 46-man engineering team headed by a man named Mr. Corley. And Mr. Corley, even though he was a team player and was trying to go along with their program, it himself said that they were blocked from investigating certain things. They couldn't go into the other buildings. They wouldn't allow them in. They wouldn't allow them to test the metal. Okay? They weren't even given floor plans for months. And Fire Engineering Magazine, a hundred-year-old fire industry publication, the editor, Bill Manning, called the FEMA investigation of the World Trade Center a half-baked farce. Now, is that an investigation? I don't think so. Here we have the Madrid or the Windsor Hotel in Madrid, Spain, in uh, early 2005, it caught fire. It burned out of a control for two days. As you can see, it was totally gutted. But look, the building didn't fall down. Use your head, folks. Don't listen to TV. And yet, the World Trade Center turns to dust and drops at free fall speed. Now, we know then that the North Tower was struck at... Uh, 846, and we were told that the fires were so uncontrollable it just melted the steel and melted the airplanes, melted all the victims. We can't get fingerprints. We can't get any evidence of anything, and yet look at this blow up. Unfortunately, it's uh, cut off a little bit here at the bottom, but we can see this poor woman who walks and is looking out of the hole. The fires can't be that big if she's up there walking around. Plus, we now have the transcripts of the New York fire captains that got to within two floors, 
And they radioed in, and they were very calm, collected, and said, yeah, send us a couple more lines, and we can knock down these fires. There was no huge fires. And my personal suspicion is that's why the South Tower collapsed first, although it had been burning less time. Because on the South Tower, we all saw the huge explosion, and that's due to the fact that the South Tower was not hit directly. It was clipped on one side and all of the jet fuel sprayed into the air, and that was the huge orange fireball that we all saw. So there went all the jet fuel. It burned off in the air. So that doesn't leave very much burning inside the building, and certainly not enough to, to melt those 47 steel core girders. And that's why at some point somebody said, we're going to have to hurry up and bring down the South Tower because if we wait much longer, those fires are going to be out, and we're going to have a hard time explaining why that tower came down. So they triggered the South Tower first. And we saw the big explosion. We also saw, and I distinctly remember this, the top of the South Tower began to tilt over, and it went to almost a 45-degree angle. And I'm sitting at home watching this on television live, and I'm going, holy cow, I said, this is going to fall off into the city and cause more deaths and more destruction. And yet, as it tilted about to here, everything just goes, turns to smoke, and the whole thing drops straight down. What stopped it from going over? Okay? And you can see that there was just a huge explosion. These explosions began in the basements. William Rodriguez, who was originally hailed as a big hero, uh, says he was in the basement and was knocked off his feet by explosions. Mike Picararo said they were in a six-floor sub-basement, and there was an explosion in the basement. And they went to the third-floor machine, machine shop, and he said it was destroyed. He said, we're talking about a 50-ton hydraulic press was just gone. Now, what set off the explosions in the basement? And if you set off huge explosions in the basement with shaped charges and shape those charges up through the center of the building, does this explain the disappearance of the, of the inner core? Notice over here, you've got heavy metal beams being thrown hundreds of feet into the air. What's the propulsion fo force? Uh, if the building just collapsed, why didn't they all just fall down? Why were they thrown for hundreds of feet in the air? Also, if I'm sure you all saw the grizzly stories, they are still finding body parts and pieces on the rooftops in New York blocks and blocks away. How do you get that if the building just fell down? Explosions, my friend, explosions. Also, under Building 7 and under the two World Trade Centers, six weeks after the event, they were finding molted steel still in liquid state un, in the deep basements of these buildings. You can see the, the red spots in this infrared photography. How do you explain that? How, how do you get molted steel deep underground when the building just fell down on itself? What caused this huge hole in, in, in World Trade Center 6 and a huge 50-foot crater in the bottom of it? Look at these girders and how they seem to be cut through. Dr. Stephen Jones, of course, uh, has done experiments with thermite and a more concentrated form called thermate, and it cuts through steel like hot butter and is used to, uh, in, in demolitions. And he has found traces of thermite at the World Trade Center metal, along with little droplets of metal. Where do you get those? Look at these cars that were several blocks away. They're scorched on one side and not scorched on the other. That's a heat wave. That's a blast effect coming out. That's not a building collapsing. And this is the one I like. These are frames from a film that show this metal girders standing up in the air. And folks, they don't fall down. They disintegrate. They just turn to dust and blow away. And that's not just some artifact of the one film because here is a, another view of the same tower. You can see that it's just turning into, uh, turning into dust. 
Notice the similarities between the right, which was the uh, explosive nature of the South Tower, and a picture of an atomic detonation in the New Mexico desert. Follow the money. That's what we were always taught in journalism school. The trade centers were owned by the Port Authority of New York, and they've been trying to get rid of them for years. They've been wanting to tear them down, but they did a feasibility study and found out that uh, it would cost more money to tear them down than they were worth. They also were having trouble with the city of New York getting permits to do that because those buildings were half filled with asbestos. So they, wouldn't, they wouldn't, couldn't do it. Now I ask you, what does the mafia do if they've got a building that they can't rent, they can't tear down, <laughs> can't do anything with, they torch it for the insurance. And I, I really hate to think that 9-11 at its heart is nothing but an insurance scam, but follow the money. Six weeks before 9-11, the Port Authority leased, it was a 99-year lease to Silverstein Properties in Westfield, America. Uh, and one of the first things he does is turn the security of the World Trade Center over to an outfit called Securicom. Uh, the CEO of Securicom is Wirt Walker III, and his cousin is a director, Marvin Bush, the younger brother of George Bush Sr., and Securicom is backed by the Kuwaiti American Corporation, which is a business entity of the Bush family. So they got control of the security at the World Trade Center. When, when could somebody have gone in there and planted charges? Anytime they wanted to. Now, they made a down payment on this $3.5 billion, 99-year lease of $125 million. A few months later, we have, uh, or six weeks later, you have 9-11. Silverstein goes to court and successfully argues that since two planes hit two of the buildings, that's two terrorist strikes, so he gets double indemnity. And after they hassle around and negotiate with the insurance company, they end up uh, getting uh, $4.6 billion, okay? $4.6 billion. And the Port Authority, in a generous gesture, said, well, gee, we're sorry you lost your buildings. Here's your $125 million back. So for a $125 million investment for about six months, considering the court cases, they made $4.6 billion. But Silverstein doesn't get all that money. It goes to the, a poor, good portion of it, half of it, goes to the mortgage holders. Large, largest holder of the mortgage on the World Trade Center was Blackstone Group, who is headed by Peter G. Peterson, who, I'm sure this is a coincidence, happens to be chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. So now you see the level at which 9-11 was played out. Quickly, what happened at the Pentagon? Something happened at the Pentagon, obviously, but I can tell you one thing for absolute certain, it was not a Boeing 757. How can I say that? Look at this picture. That's the hole in the Pentagon before the wall collapsed. It's no more than 10 to 15 foot high. It's no wider than 18, 19, 20 feet. A Boeing 757 has a wingspan of 125 feet and a tail height of 44 feet. That's four stories, my friend. How do you get a big old huge multi-ton jet with a wingspan of 125 feet and a height of 44 feet into a hole about 19 by 20 foot and at ground level. I've talked to many pilots. I'm an award-winning aviation aerospace rider. Uh, those jumbo jets, they want to fly. They want to go. And when they're at speed, they're creating such air pressure under them that they cannot get lower than 60 to 80 feet to the ground because of the air pressure. That's why they have to cut the engines, throttle down, you know, turn off everything just to land. And yet we're told this plane was going 500 miles an hour, full throttle, and hit the lower floor, the bottom of the Pentagon. Physically impossible. Can't happen. In addition, if you'll read my book, The Terror Conspiracy, you'll find I interviewed a woman named April Gallup. She crawled through that hole to escape. How could she crawl through that hole and survive if there was such intense fire that it melted every little piece of that airplane? And this is how in Congress their story is. 
Early on, they said the plane hit the ground and ricocheted into the building. They hadn't counted on the fact that firemen and people on the highway had digital cameras, and before that day was out, they were posting these pictures showing a perfectly clear lawn. So they had to change their story. They said, oh, well, it, it didn't hit the ground. It just hit the building, and it bored a hole, and the wings folded back, and the tail folded back, and it became like a torpedo, and it just buried itself in there, and then burst into flame with such intensity that, that it just destroyed everything, burned everything up. Engines, wheel assemblies, everything gone. Don't laugh. That's what they're telling you. Okay? And then, so, Okay. But then, a week or two later, the FBI comes out and announces that they've identified all the victims on Flight 77. How? Through their fingerprints. <laughs> fingerprints? It burns up this huge metallic plane, but they've got fingerprints? And then they had to back off and they go, well, well, we do have pieces, uh, we do have wreckage. Well, where is it? It's in a warehouse. Okay, fine. Show me a picture of that wreckage in a warehouse and I'll shut up. But you haven't seen it, and you won't, because they don't have it. This is a picture that was shot by an AP photographer before the wall collapsed. You can see down here this little bitty fire, which seems to be in a smudge pot or some kind of barrel. And in fact, they had all these firemen out there, and yet in the films and photographs taken that day, there's a little fire, and then it goes out, and then there's a little fire at the same place again. And then later on, a little more fire at that same place again, and it's throwing smoke all everything, you know. What, they can't put out this barrel full of fire? But look at the photograph. Where's the plane? Where's the wings? Where's the tail assembly? Where's the wreckage? There's what a plane crash looks like, folks, and I've been to many of them. It's not a pretty sight. It's a mess. There's debris everywhere. The tail section is usually intact. That's the, one of the strongest parts on a plane, and it's usually the last to hit, so it's usually intact. The, the wings break off, but there's usually big sections. But the main thing are those huge jet engines. You can't destroy those babies. You know, they're, they're, ton, they're a thousand tons or something like that. So, you know, so where is that? It's the Pentagon. It is not there. No, what they have shown us is one, five frames that shows a little fireball going up, and you can't see anything. There's no airplane. Even Bill O'Reilly was caught on that one. He's, he touts for all day saying, we're going to show you the film. You're going to see the airplane. So much for the conspiracy theorist. And when they actually ran the film, even O'Reilly said, well, i got to admit, I, I don't really see an airplane. <laughs> it's not really there. And the people who have actually studied it closely said they, that you might be able to see what appears to be maybe the nose of something, but it is certainly not a Boeing 757. Again, look at the lawn. You could play golf on that lawn. Where's the wreckage? It's not there. And that's even after the wall has collapsed. And here's the good one. Look at this. The wall's collapsed. Now, we're supposed to have this giant fire there that burned up this entire airliner, and yet you can see a computer model, uh, monitor sitting up there on a desk. You can see a wooden desk sitting there, you know, and you look, notice how clean those walls are up there. No fire got to them. So where's that intense fire? They're just lying to you, folks. This is worse than the Warren Commission. At least in the, in the Kennedy assassination, about all you could say for certain early on was that shots were fired in Daly Plaza. And some people said they came from the Knoll, and some people said they came from the, towards the Book Depository, and some people said they came somewhere else. And it's a big mystery. Here, you can just look at it. It didn't happen the way they said it happened. 9-11 omission report. 115 re relevant omissions. Building 7 that I spent so much time on. How did the 9-11 Commission report deal with Building 7? They didn't. They never even mentioned it. How's that for an investigation? Here's just, I won't even go into them, but here are some of the omissions that they did not tell you about. One of the key questions I'd like to have answered and I think would point to who are the culprits truly behind 9-11 is who authorized 140 Saudis, including 40 members of the bin Laden family, to fly across the country during the no-fly zone when you and I couldn't fly, gather in Boston, and then leave the country without being interrogated. Who authorized that? 
Well, we know who authorized it. Richard Clark, who was the head of the counterterrorism chief, said he authorized it, but that wasn't his idea. Somebody had to give him the order and the approval to do that. And I want to know who it was. And I think we all know who it probably was because there's only a limited number of people above Richard Clark, Condoleezza Rice, Cheney, and Bush. The other key to understanding 9-11 is the war game exercises. They were carrying on a series of war game exercises that morning that threw our defense system into total disarray and chaos. Everybody remember 1999 when the golfer Payne Stewart was up in a Learjet and they suffered an oxygen problem and they passed out or died and his plane went off course? Within 14 minutes there were interceptors around his plane and they tracked it all day, ready to shoot it down if it was going to go into an inhabited area, but luckily it didn't, and it finally crashed out in an isolated area. Hour and a half, these planes are flying around on 9-11 with no interceptors. Why? Because they were all up in Canada, or they're out over the Atlantic, carrying on, according to the Pentagon, Cold War exercises. Well, the Cold War had been over for 10 years. What are we doing conducting Cold War exercises on the morning of 9-11? But it gets worse than that. They had false radar images on the NORAD's radar screens called inputs, simulating hijacked aircraft. They didn't know which was real and which was not. When Richard Clark calls Richard Myers, the head of NORAD, and said, have you got interceptors in the air? He says, well, we're in the middle of a war game exercise. When FAA contacts NORAD and says, we've got four planes hijacked, the first th Colonel Marr, first thing he says was, is this the real world or the exercise? They were totally thrown off. And yet, for a year, everybody wrote that off, said, war game exercises, oh, that's an internet rumor. Uh-uh. It actually happened. I interviewed a Sergeant Lauro Chavez who was in Southern Command in Florida. He said one of the exercises that they were running on the morning of 9-11 was hijacked aircraft flying and crashing into the World Trade Center. And he said, suddenly there's a buzz, people are looking around, they put CNN on the monitors and they, like we, could see these planes crashing into the World Trade Center and said their jaws hit the ground. How can this happen? How can something that we're strategizing happen in real life? And that's a good question, folks. How could it? Who's been asked these questions? What did the 9-11 Commission say about war game exercises? They mentioned one in a footnote. It wasn't there. They don't talk about it. He also said that any of you been in the military know that you have to know your chain of command. You have to know who your sergeant is. You have to know who your captain is, your major, your commanding officer, your division commander, your brigade commander, your army commander, right on up to the Secretary of Defense and the President. And they were told several months before 9-11 that Dick Cheney had assumed command of NORAD. First time that I'm aware of that a military officer was, was not in command of the National uh, uh, North American Air Defense Command. He also told me that out of 33 war games he had participated in, the one on the morning of 9-11 was the only one he was aware of that had been classified top secret. Now, were the hijackers aware of this, these war game exercises? Absolutely. The NSA, the day before, intercepted an electronic message from Muhammad Atta, which they said they didn't translate till the day after, but it said the match is about to begin. Tomorrow is zero hour. Notice he didn't say the jihad or the operation, or the attack. He said the match, the games. The games begin tomorrow. That's zero hour. That's when we're going to hijack the airplanes. How could he have known about these top secret war game exercises that we didn't know about for more than a year? Only one way, inside information. And this is what proves to me that 9-11 was an inside job. Inside job. CIA creates al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda moves drugs and helped train the Kosovo Liberation Army for the CIA. Osama bin Laden, you'll read all about this in my book, was brought to this country under the name Tim Osman, given arms and ammunition and, and support for creating Al-Qaeda. 
Al-Qaeda is being funded by Saudi charities, not through the private money of bin Laden. And, uh, and it was a bin Laden family member, Salim bin Laden, who put up the money to put George W. Bush in the oil business back in the 80s, or Busto Energy in Houston, Texas. That's how closely connected they are with the bin Laden family. Does it begin to smell a little fishy to you guys? Inside job. And the problem we, one of the problems we have is we have no vision by our leadership. I mean, he, he, he can't even take the uh, lens caps off his binoculars. And all of this sounds like it doesn't make any sense. Why would they do something like this? Why would anybody do anything like this? It's the New World Order, folks. Here is the Canamex superhighway that they're going to put in from southern Mexico to Canada. Uh, the only customs port is the Smart Port in Kansas City, Missouri. There goes the southern border. The Smart Port in Kansas City will be staffed by Mexicans, and the Mexicans are now demanding that it be considered sovereign Mexican territory. Internal documents show that by 2015, they're expecting as many as 1,000 trucks through there a day. There's no way to physically inspect those trucks, so they're saying it's okay. They're going to have RFID chips on them, radio frequency identification chips, right? Okay, so a truck comes through, and Manuel goes with a scanner and says, baby carriages. Okay, going through. How do we know what's in that truck? Could be loaded with terrorists, AK-47s, a nuclear bomb, who knows? But they don't care. This is why they have not guarded the border. This is, where, this is the chink in their armor. They want us to be fearful and give in to everything because we're fighting a war on terrorism, but they won't close or secure the borders because they don't want borders. We're going to be the North American Union. They are creating in North America what they have created in Europe. It started as the European common market. It was just an economic thing. And then pretty soon, well, we've got to have a parliament to oversee the economics. And, well, we need to standardize the money, so we'll start dealing in euros. And now they've got a European Union, which some of the countries are already balking at. And, and you know, the French refused to, to ratify the Constitution. And others saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're taking away all our national sovereignty. Now they've got a fighter in their hands. Folks, we need to fight now before we have to start resisting the North American Parliament. How am I doing on time? Have we got time for questions and answers? Okay, I'm going to assume that we can take a few questions and answers. You need to come to this microphone right here. Please speak clearly and identify yourself. And if I can answer you, I will. Are we on? Okay. Quick question. Uh -oh. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, speak on? Right. right up into it. All right. Quick question. If that, if that Boeing did not crash into the Pentagon, where is it? Where is it? Okay. Good question. All right. That leads to a scenario that I will put out to you, but I want to point out that this is not a, this is, I agree with this. But this was not my scenario. This is a scenario that was proposed by Chris Carter, the guy that wrote the X-Files. And this is a scenario that was aired in March of 2001, six months before 9-11, in a pilot program spin off of the X-Files called The Lone Gunman, okay? And in there, the father, who is a government employee of one of the lone gunmen, uh, apparently has been killed in a one-car auto crash. They find out that actually uh, it was murder because there was a contr an electronic controlling device that controlled the car. Then they find out it wasn't even his dad, the blood type didn't match, and that uh, there had been an assassin attempt to kill his dad and, and had gotten killed in the process. And the dad, realizing that they were trying to kill him, said, the only way I can protect myself is if I'm dead. So he put the assassin in the car and guided it into the bridge, okay? And then they finally catch up with the dad and they say, why are they trying to kill you? And he says, it's because of war game plan 12B. And they said, what's that? And he said, that's where they hijack a commercial airliner using a overriding electronic system 
gain control of the airplane, and they're going to fly it into the World Trade Center. And it's going to create such horror and such demand that the military industrial complex, the Defense Department budget will be increased and everybody's jobs are secure and will continue to go on. And it's all part of a military war game exercises that they are piggybacking with their true attack. This was proposed six months before 9-11. And folks, that's what happened on 9-11. At that time, most of us were not aware of Global Hawk technology. Global Hawk technology is off-the-shelf technology. It's been in existence since the 80s. And, and to put it very simply, if you know anything about CB radios, if you have a CB radio and I have a stronger signal, I, what they call, I step on you. I can override your signal. And people talk to me instead of you. They can do the same thing with the computer-driven Boeing heavy-body jets. They can overwhelm their electronic signals, capture them electronically, and fly them anywhere they want to go. In, in the summer of 2001, a Boeing 737 lifted off from Edwards Air Force Base, flew all the way to Australia, flew 12 missions, flew back, landed safely, no one on board. It was all being controlled from an air base somewhere on ground where they have like a link trainer. You got a guy there and he's controlling the whole thing. This is not exotic technology. They had it then and I'm convinced it was, it was being used on 9-11. Yes, sir. Concerns the put options on the airlines involved, supposedly involved in 9-11. Did those yes. records disappear with Building 7? No but they disappeared. What he's talking about is, and some of you should remember that in the days following 9-11, even the mainstream media was talking about these strange put options, uh, short selling of stock uh, in American Airlines, United Airlines, and their insurance carriers, which evinced foreknowledge of the attacks. Someone could not resist the temptation to profit on their foreknowledge of these attacks. And they made a big deal of it, this, and they said, the FBI is going to investigate and see if that doesn't track to Osama bin Laden. You've never heard another word about it, have you? And that's because it did not track to Osama bin Laden. It tracked back to people connected to our Central Intelligence Agency. Interesting. Dave from Phoenix. I just was curious uh, your thoughts, if you had any, if you'd done any research into the report that Flight 93 actually landed at um, Cleveland Hopkins Airport? In Cleveland? Yeah. The okay. I don't know if y'all heard that. He was asking about the reports that Flight 93 landed at Cleveland. The mayor of Cleveland on the morning of 9-11 went on television and said, we have an emergency at the, at the airport here. And actually two planes landed at Cleveland that morning. And they were segregated at opposite ends of the field. Passengers were offloaded. They've made a study of this. There's some confusion. They, you know, sometimes they said there was a hundred and something passengers, which seemed to be a Delta flight, which was a legitimate bomb scare type thing. The other flight, the flight which was identified as Flight 93, and then later they backtracked and said, no, it wasn't, but that's never been explained. And that one only had supposedly like 50 or 60 people on board, which is really, really unusual and was about the number that was supposedly on Flight 93. It's, it's, an, it's an issue that definitely needs serious investigation, but of course, there hasn't been any investigation. Hadn't been any real investigation to this day. We've got the conspiracy theory, and we're supposed to be happy with that. that and that's one of the things that I remember. During 2000, 2001, I was flying quite frequently. And I always am hoping and praying that if you're in a three-row seat, that somebody doesn't sit in the middle seat, right? I spread out a little bit. I don't feel crunched in to everybody. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Every flight I was on was packed. In fact, there was some stories going around and some complaints that the airlines were actually canceling flights if they weren't fully booked so that they could cram up the rest because they were hurting for money and uh, they were trying to maximize their profit. And yet we're told on the morning of 9-11, you got these three flights, four flights, and 50 people on one, 60 people on another, on a 200 and something plus passenger airliner. I always wondered about that. Jim, thank you for enlightening us. We really enjoy you. And uh, I wanted to point out a couple of things that I noticed. First of all, there was a lot of talk about the uh, 
phone conversations from cell phones on Flight 93. And, you know, one of my observations is I haven't heard any talk about phone conversations on the planes that hit from people on the planes that hit the World Trade Center. I wonder what happened to their ability to transmit a telephone call. Good question. And that's something that a lot of people will bring up. Well, you've got to be, we've got the cell phone calls. Barbara Olson, she called and talked and said, oh, my God, the city's below us. Oh, my God, you know. 1999, I have a copy of a Washington Post article where they're quoting a ranking general who said, gentlemen, we've gathered here uh, to overthrow the government of the United States. Of course, he didn't say that. This general was actually at Los Alamos, Al Alamos uh, Laboratories seeing a demonstration of voice morphing. This is where they can take a snippet of your voice and then they can build an entire conversation around it. And I'm not saying this happened, I'm not even totally convinced it happened, but I think there is persuasive evidence to indicate that some of these cell phone calls, which if you'll remember, it was not until 2004 that American Airlines and a technology company announced they had finally got a chip that might allow a call from a high-flying uh, airliner. There's been a lot of argument about this. Some people say you can't, can't make a cell phone call past 5,000 feet. Others say you can't make a cell phone call because the planes are moving too fast. By the time your signal is captured by one of those microwave towers, you're past it and gone on. Others have said, well, you know, at a certain place, a certain date, I was up there and I managed to get a connection. And so, but it's hit and miss. But what we do know is they have the technology to take a person's voice and create phone conversations. One of the guys that called in, Chip Barrett, I believe it was, or something like that, you'll remember the conversation because I think it was published in Reader's Digest or something. He calls his mother and, hi, Mom, this is Jim Mars. <coughs> you know, whoever does that, you know, your mother knows who you are. He says, I've been hijacked. And she says, oh, well, who is it? He says, well, you, you do believe me, don't you, Mom? Yeah, yeah, I believe you, but who, who's on board? Who's, what's happening on there? You do believe me, don't you, Mom? Yeah, yeah, I do, but, but, but tell me what's happening. You do believe me, don't you, Mom? Apparently, that was the only voice snippet they could get, see? So, I think it's entirely possible that the phone, uh, cell phone messages uh, are all contrived, okay? Barbara Olson, of course, was a news commentator. Her voice was everywhere. There would have been no problem getting a really good conversation from her. Hi. Um, hey, Melinda. Hi there. Hi. Mm -hmm. Two things I've heard, because to me, regarding what happened to the people on all three planes that this gentleman asked earlier about, I think is, is real important, which you addressed with the, was it Cleveland Airport? Mm -hmm. I heard two stories from two different 9-11 researchers. Unfortunately, I'm not remembering who said it. It was at a 9-11 conference in L.A. Um, one of them was that airport employees in Cleveland who said two planes landed that and the number of people I think was supposed to have equaled ex the exact amount by off by four or something like that is what I heard. And that witnesses from the airport had come forward or, or employees totally you know, frightened or whatever, that they saw these people sequestered at gunpoint into one building together and yep. no one ever saw them again. That's yep. one story. And so I don't know if you can shed any light on that that, that I've heard. I've and heard then that the, too, but see, how do we prove any of this? Is one of the researchers I heard, and I, unfortunately I'm not remembering who said this at all, said he went out and interviewed people in Shanksville in the area where the plane came down. And he said people said, interviewing in the air, like no one had gone out into the local community. And they had said, body parts by the truckload had rained down on their homes in this community, that this plane had been blown out of the air, and that, and that there was so much carnage that it had to have been more, it looked like to them, than the number of people on that plane. And so the idea is that maybe these people in Cleveland, so this is the theory that I've heard someone say, mm -hmm. is that these people may have been then put on this other plane, which was the one that was then shot out of the air. Okay. So just tell me what you, if you know anything about well, any of that. Folks, we're here <laughs> into the area of conjecture, okay? And I, I want to make that clear. The problem is we don't know. And we'll never know until we demand a truthful investigation by our so-called leaders. But what she's talking about is, here's another thing you, don't, you may not know or remember. Flight 93 disappeared from the radar screens for more than eight minutes. That means it really got low or landed, okay? 
and one of the theories is, and I think that's what Melinda was getting at, is that they took the 50, 60 people off of these other planes and loaded them all into 93 and then blew it out of the sky over Pennsylvania. And when I say blew it out of the sky, I am absolutely 100% tell you that's what happened. How can I say that? Because the official conspiracy theory is, let's roll, and they were fighting on board, and the plane was driven into the ground. Uh-uh. It left an eight-mile-long debris trail, which means that plane was coming apart in midair. They, I've even heard the cockpit uh, recordings uh, of the FAA uh, uh, controller uh, talking to another airplane, and they say, we got him in sight. Uh, uh, yeah, I see black smoke. So the plane's in trouble up in the air. I also saw an interview with the F-16 pilot that trailed Flight 93. And number one, he confirms that he was on war game exercises. He also claimed that as such, he only had training ammunition and no missiles, which means he couldn't have shot down Flight 93 even if he had wanted to. In fact, according to his story, he said, he was getting worried because the thought was crossing his mind that if this hijacked airplane started looking like it was heading for a populated area or a high-profile target, he was actually considering, I may have to kamikaze into it to stop it. He said, but luckily he didn't have to make that decision because it went down. Something knocked that plane out of the sky. My suspicion is, since we have the voice, pit, uh, voice cockpit recorder where we hear a voice saying, that. Stay calm, we have a bomb on board, okay? And since I, you can also hear in the air traffic control was going, what did he say, what was that, something about a bomb? And another aircraft said, said yes, we, we heard bomb, we heard they had a bomb on board, okay? Let's say they brought a bomb on board and Global Hawk technology is in play. If they can fly the plane, they can trigger a bomb. And so when they, re and I think the less roll scenario may be true. I think by this point, because the phone conversation, and I can't remember his name, Todd Beamer, I think it was, who, who was on the phone, this was not a cell phone call, this was a radio telephone on the back of a seat, and he calls his wife. His wife tells him about what's happening in New York, and undoubtedly he told that to the rest of the passengers, and I think they realized they were in deep doo-doo and they had to do something. And so I tend to believe the story of less roll and that they were fighting back. In fact, I think they may have uh, uh, won because the last two transmissions from 93 was a voice that came on and said, we have control of the cockpit. And then a few seconds later, <coughs> same voice said, we've been hit by something. And then that was the last of it. I think they got control of the airplane. It looked like it was entirely possible that they would be able to land it safely we would find out that there were no hijackers or that these hijackers were not Muslim fanatics but CIA mercenary assets. The whole game would be up, so somebody triggered 93, blew it up in midair. Hi, Jim. Hi. I, I'm Tricia from Tucson. I was um, accosting you two years ago here saying, my God, I can't believe you're still alive, you know, <laughs> drunk as I was then. Well, but anyway. I'm in worse shape, but I'm still here. <laughs> um, my question is, there are so many of us now, and statistics now are up to 85%, 90% who believe that this was an inside job. I'd like to know, as an American citizen who, uh, I still petition Congress, I still write them, and, and uh, I want to know what can we do. This has been a crime against the people of the United States. Right. These people, these criminals, they are low-life criminals. Right. I'm sorry they're in the offices there are, but they are criminals. That's right. What can we do to get rid of them? Okay, what can we do? <laughs> All right, first off, you can do the normal things, and I would advocate this. Write letters to the editors, okay? Call the station managers and the programming managers of your local TV and radio stations. Don't worry about national stuff. It's totally under control but they, sometimes they slip in local markets. So call the station managers, call the news programmers, call the editors, write letters to the editors, demand that they do what they say they are, being the watchdogs of the public. And don't do it in an accusatory manner, that doesn't get anybody anything. Send them information. 
And then when you talk to your friends, hold study groups in your home, uh, hold a meeting at your church, hold a meeting at your library, hold a meeting at your school, and then ask the questions. What happened to Building 7? Who authorized the Bin Ladens to fly across country? You know, uh, why, are, why are we supposed to believe the war on terror is real when they won't even guard the borders? Ask these questions and get people to thinking. You're going to be amazed. Most of you people, I feel like I'm here preaching to the choir, okay? You guys are mostly on board, but all your friends and or neighbors are not. So get out there and just do it in a question manner. Don't say, hey, you idiot, don't you understand what's going on? That ain't going to get anybody anywhere. But you say, hey, you know, what, what brought down Building 7? And they're going to go, what's Building 7? And then you explain it to them. You say, how do you explain that? And they go, well, uh, uh, and you know, now you got them thinking. And maybe you'll get them opening up, okay? I, I can't tell you in a broad scope general, for each and every one of you, here's what you do. You're going to have to take it upon yourself. Educate yourself, then get out there and start educating your fellow Americans. And I can tell you this, when we get to the tipping point, okay, when there's more people who understand the truth of what's going on, whether it's Kennedy, whether it's 9-11, whether it's UFOs, when there's more people who understand what's really going on than not, that sheer knowledge will change things. Thank you, Mr. Mars. Um, I have a quick question here. I'm, my name is Lee Rutledge, by the way. I'm from Las Vegas. Um, I was curious, for a show of hands here real quick, how many people know that the World Trade Center was one of the largest gold suppositories in the country? Does everyone know that? Yep. Okay, I'd like you to talk about that if you could, please. That, that's right. something that no one's mentioned yet today. Uh, that, that other than Building 7, in my opinion, uh, the, the gold that was held <laughs> under the World Trade Centers, which personally I didn't know about, about until after all this stuff is being talked about, it was one of the largest, I think the largest gold suppository in the, in the world, if not especially in the country. Right. So. Well, I, I, I said at the very beginning of this that I wasn't going to, I was hitting the high points. I'm trying to hit the stuff that everybody can understand. The gold issue is very significant, but it's also very murky. Uh, first they say, oh, we got all the gold out. Well, how'd they get the gold out if they didn't know what was going to happen? Okay? And when did they get the gold out? While the guys are fighting the fires, you know? And, and but before I get back to that, I've got to mention Giuliani, who now looks like he's going to run for president or be some hot dog. Here's a question for Giuliani. Y'all remember, you saw the news accounts. He did not go to his multi-million dollar hardened command center in Building 7. He went to a temporary command center on Versey Street, and he said while he was there, somebody ran in and said, you got to evacuate, the Twin Towers are coming down. And he said they were in the process of evacuating when the buildings came down, and you remember seeing these all covered with dust and all like that. I would like to ask you, Mr. Giuliani, who told you the buildings were coming down, and how did they know? And why didn't they tell the firemen in those buildings? Okay, and there's another whole issue there, the Motorola uh, radios that didn't work. Okay, big thing. Now, back to your question about the gold. Right. There was gold repository there. In fact, they found a truck, okay, that apparently had broken down with them trying to get the gold out. All right, but the problem is, one thing is, they got all the gold out. Don't worry, folks, they got all the gold out. But where is it? Nobody seems to know and how much they get out, nobody seems to know. And how did they know to go get the gold and get it out? Nobody seems it's to know. It's over a trillion dollars, over a trillion, with a T as in Tom, a trillion dollars, I a believe. A trillion dollars. Right. Speaking of money, the day before 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld publicly was forced to admit that the Pentagon could not account for $2.3 trillion. The next day, the Pentagon's hit on the one side that was hardly inhabited, but the largest casualties in the Pentagon occurred not in the Naval Communications Center, but in the Army's accounting office. The very people who would have had to explain where the $2.3 trillion went to, and by the way, you've never heard any more about that story, have you? Follow the money and the goals are good one, question. One more quick thing. Um, has anyone heard the soundbite of Bush talking about seeing the first plane hit on yes. television? Has anybody seen yes. that? Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure. Good. That's, a, that's, that's a, just an anomaly. 
I don't know whether to see this as something sinister or just another example that Bush can't string words together or think very clearly. But more than once, publicly and recorded, he said he saw the first plane hit the North Tower, and he said, being a pilot, I thought, boy, there's one terrible pilot, okay? And yet we all know that nobody saw the first plane hit the tower except people standing in the street because nobody was there to film it. Now, by the time the second plane came in, everybody in the world was watching. Again, the traumatic experience. One hits, all the news cameras gather, and here comes the second one so we can all see it. It was not until the next day that a French documentary team that had been filming in the streets of New York made public their film, which they were filming an interview, heard them now, and they pan up, you see the plane, and you see it hit the North Tower. That is, the, as far as I know, the only films or photographs of the plane hitting the North Tower, and yet Bush, more than once, told us he saw the plane hit the North Tower. We also know that in the months prior to that, they had mentioned that they had a direct, Secret Service had a direct line with the Pentagon, and maybe he did see the plane hit the Pentagon, or hit the, hit the Trade Center. Yes, sir. This is not a, this is uh, not speak, a, speak right in the microphone. I, this is not to negate that 911 did happen, but in the equation of China and Russia, how did they fit into 911? Okay, how did China and Russia fit into the 911? Those were two. China the, and Russia. Huh? China. How did China and Russia fit into 911. Yeah. How did China and Russia fit into 911? That's right. Okay. They were two of these about uh, a dozen countries who tried to warn us that we were about to be attacked. Just recently it came out that Cuba, our big enemy, Fidel Castro, uh, don't buy those cigars. He also tried to warn us we were gonna be attacked. The one I like was, and thoroughly documented, the Taliban in Afghanistan tried to warn us that we were gonna be attacked. Is that amazing? That's why the proof of foreknowledge, the, the, the proof that other countries, including Russia and China, tried to warn us that we're about to be attacked. Remember how Bush resisted turning over his presidential daily briefing papers? Resisted for years. Finally, it came out, August 2001. Bin Laden determined attack in the U.S. They knew it. They knew it. That's why there's no question in my mind that they knew this attack was going to take place. That, and that's the best light you can put on it. The worst light is once you understand the connections between Bush, the CIA, the Saudis, the bin Laden family, uh, then you could make a pretty compelling argument that it was worse than they knew about it. They orchestrated it. But I'll be the first to say I'm not sure we can prove that at this point in time. But hey, they let it happen. That's just about as bad, right? Okay, do we have another question? I'm Jeff Barringer from Visalia. Uh, that's near Fresno. And I'm convinced it's an inside job. You don't have to convince me on that. I'm convinced that something caused the destruction of the Pentagon. But what was it if it wasn't the airplane? I, I, well, I'll tell you what, rather than go through all the theories, and there's several theories, I, I, would, I would encourage you to read the appendix of my book, The Terror Conspiracy. At the very back is an appendix written by Barbara Honiger, a military journalist with very, very good contacts in the Pentagon, and she's had some interviews with people that nobody else has been able to talk to, and she presents a very cogent argument that what happened in the Pentagon were bombs placed in the Pentagon. But then there's also seems to be little question that something came from the outside and caused some damage, but this allowed them to argue that a plane hit the Pentagon. But as the gentleman asked, what was it? Well, we don't know for sure, but I will simply quote you uh, what Donald Rumsfeld was quoted by Parade Magazine when he said, the planes that hit the World Trade Center and the missile that hit the Pentagon. So, in that instance, Rummy may have been telling us the truth. Okay, any other questions? And you left out, he said, the plane that was shot down over Pennsylvania. And um, the official Building 7, uh, I mean, uh, 
the FEMA study says that Building 7, their best hypothesis had very little ability. Um, Low probability. Yeah, yeah, that's what it said. Yeah. Yeah. And um, tell us yeah. about it. They said, our best guess as to what, this was, this was their official finding, our best guess as to what caused the collapse of Building 7 has very low probability of actually happening. <laughs> How about that for, for a conclusion? And uh, tell us about Project Northwoods. Northwoods, okay. In case you don't know about Northwoods, and I think we're about out of time here, um, how, how are we doing? Oh, I turned my. Got, oh, great, we're doing great. Northwoods, okay, here again uh, goes to the heart of the question of would Americans allow attacks, deadly attacks, on other Americans? So let me, th and this story is just rife with irony. This is one of the most ironic stories I know of. In 1962, following the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion, President Kennedy was thoroughly disgusted with the CIA and it was threatening to splinter it into a thousand pieces and cast it to the winds. And he took the secret war against Castro away from the CIA and he turned it over to the Pentagon. Well, the Pentagon planners, they went to work, okay? And they realized right away that building up a massive military invasion of Cuba, that's a no-brainer, we just have to do the logistics. The problem they had was, how do we get, how do we sell this to the American people, okay? So they came up with Operation Northwoods. Operation Northwoods basically said that they, meaning the Pentagon and their assets, hired mercenaries, CIA agents, private contract agents, whoever, were going to hijack airplanes, hijack ships on the high sea, set off bombs in American cities, target Americans for assassination, and blame it all on Castro so that an infuriated American public would support another invasion of Cuba. Never, never forget that this plan was signed off on, agreed to, approved by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They said, good plan. President Kennedy is the one who said, no, we're not going to do that. What are you doing? That's not what we're all about. Well, that make us no better than them. You know, we're not going to do that. And he ordered all the plans for Northwood destroyed. And apparently most of them were, except typical government bureaucracy. Somewhere a set of Northwood plans sat in a government filing cabinet for years and years and years until the mid-1990s when the Assassination Records Review Board, formed by Congress in the wake of the Oliver Stone movie, JFK, and charged with pulling out any documents that might have to do with the year, Kennedy years or the Kennedy assassination, they find Northwoods and they place it in the National Archives where it then becomes public. And now we know that they were gonna pull this plan in 1962. One of the scenarios offered in Northwoods, 1962, was to take a regularly scheduled commercial airliner, fill it with people that they had control over, their assets, family members, military people, and then after takeoff, land it at uh, Eglin Air Force Base, offload the passengers, change the tail numbers, and it goes back in service as another aircraft. Then they're going to take a similar type aircraft uh, and put the tail numbers of the commercial aircraft on this one and then send it off as a drone aircraft, remote controlled, 1962. They're going to fly the drone aircraft over the Caribbean and remotely kick on a tape recorder that's going to broadcast a mayday signal saying they're being attacked by Cuban MiGs and then remotely they blow the plane up over the Caribbean, blame it on Castro, and we demand an invasion of Cuba. 1962, folks, in 2001, I think we saw an updated and modernized version of that same plan. Okay, is that it? One more. Jim, Jim with your permission, could I just comment on the missing flight 77? Sure. Okay. Uh, all of the airspace over Washington, D.C. is restricted, even to the military. So if you had a 757 jetliner fly over the district, it would cause a lot of attention, draw a lot of attention from the people on the ground. 
And in the PSYOPs, which I believe the Pentagon attack was, you, you typically would create a diversion. So while everybody's looking up at the, the plane flying over the district, the real weapon hits the building. And the burden of, evi the, the burden of evidence indicates that it was a cruise missile. There were credible reports that people saw this 757 fly over the district. There were credible witnesses. There were also credible witnesses that the plane actually landed safely at Washington National. I don't know whether that was true or not. Tip well, I, I, that, that's true, but if, you know, if they can make the if Air Force... If anyone on board. If they can make the Air Force disappear for two hours, they can make those people disappear, okay? Yeah. But what's important is, if you look at the Pentagon, it's easier to prove what did not happen than what actually happened, okay? And, and the, one, of, what, one of the most important facts is you've got two huge turbofan engines that weigh almost nine tons. They're virtually indestructible. Yep. Made of steel and titanium. If they'd hit the side of that building, you'd have three holes in the building, not one. That's right. They're, they're, that, you know, that. Right. Well. To, to address what both these gentlemen were saying is, uh, to me, that's the proof that a big Boeing 757 did not hit the Pentagon, okay? Now, what did, that's what we're still arguing about. Again, I would defer to Donald Rumsfeld when he said it was a missile. Uh, <laughs> yes? Have you, have you heard about uh, any videotapes that were in the local businesses surveying their parking yes. lots in the area yeah. that were confiscated by government officials? Yeah. And have those been disclosed and were those reported on in the 9-11 commission reports? No. No. And uh, no. There were 85 security camera tapes, many on and around the Pentagon, the rest in businesses there, if you've ever been to the Pentagon, it actually kind of sits low, and there's a hill over here, and there's all these big hotels, and they've all got security cameras on them. There was a Sitco gas station aimed right at the Pentagon. Okay, the Sheridan had filmed that the uh, employees actually saw before the FBI got in there, and they said they were horrified, but then past that, they were ordered not to talk. Eighty-five of these tapes were taken, and... Wouldn't it be simple to solve all this by just, you know, surely out of 85 tapes, they've got one or two that shows this big plane piling into the Pentagon. Just show it to us and we'll all shut up, right? But no, you haven't seen it. In fact, all you see is, and I've got the frames here on the back of, uh, of my book, and all you really see is just a smoke and explosion. And if you'll notice down here at the time code, it says September the 12th, 2001. So they don't even have the time right or the date right. I mean, the whole thing's insane. And then they didn't, didn't release anything for two years. And then they released five frames that didn't really show anything. And everybody said, well, I don't see anything. So then after another year, they released uh, like 14 frames of the same tape. That was five plus a few more. And you still can't see anything. And where's the other, where's the other uh, tapes? Another thing we all know is that after every major air disaster, whether it's military or civilian, uh, if it's civilian, it's the National Transportation Safety Board, they gather up every little piece they can find of that aircraft and they take it to a hangar or, or, or a warehouse and they reconstruct it to find out what happens precisely so that they'll see it doesn't happen again. Show me a picture of that wreckage. Just show me a picture of the wreckage, okay? But you're not going to see it because it's not there because it didn't happen. I mean, this thing, this is in-your-face lies. And then they, they create this 9-11 commission, you know, packed full of people who have been nothing but government cover-up artists for years. They don't even address Billing 7. They spend three pages talking about the creation of Al-Qaeda and never once breathe the name CIA. I mean, it's just, it's just absolutely, it's infuriating is what it is. They must think that we are absolute fools and apparently we are because six years out and those people are still in office, you know. Let me, let me tell you what George Bush Sr. Uh, told uh, the Sarah McClendon, the old White House correspondent. She's passed away now. But in 1992, in her July newsletter, uh, she was having a little interview with Bush. 
and Bush never said anything more true in his life. And I'm sure he was probably, this is out of context, he was probably talking about who knows what, but it's true across the board. He said, Sarah, if the American people ever learn what we have done to them, they will chase us down the street and lynch us. Think about that one. Jim, did you, did you see the MSNBC poll uh, two days after the uh, recent elections in November? Uh, 355,000 people, last I checked, had voted, and 85% on a, uh, had voted for impeachment of Bush based on right. what he had done. Right. Now, do you, that brings us to what we need to do about this. And you had said write letters to the editor. But what do you think, could you comment just a, uh, briefly about uh, Diebold, ES, uh, ES oh, and S, Sequoia? You're, and, you're into the computer voting. And I'll tell you, my personal opinion is we'll never be a free country again until we go back to paper ballots and poll watchers. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I, I can't help but think of a sign that I saw carried by some demonstrator out in front of the White House, and it said, would somebody please give George Bush a blowjob so we can impeach him? <laughs> <laughs> and it is kind of amazing that we can impeach Bill Clinton over sex with an intern, but we can't impeach Bush over the over murder of 3,000 people and unconstitutional wars and everything else. Well, what's happening here? Who's in control? <laughs> Melinda, you got one more question? Okay. I, I think the majority of us are on board with you that this has happened, and it's wool pulled over our eyes. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so my question is, just a quick synopsis, if you could give us your top ten reasons why they did this. Oh, well, like everything else, it's multi-layered. The Kennedy assassination was not done just for Vietnam or just to stop him from talking about UFOs or just to stop him from ending the Vietnam War or just to stop him from issuing treasury notes that are non-interest bearing. You know, it was that aggregate. It was all those straws that broke the camel's back. And on 9-11, I think we have the exact same thing. First, you've got the Project for a New American Century, which a year before it said, <coughs> excuse me, had said that uh, they had parroted Dick Cheney's call when he was Secretary of Defense that we needed to invade Afghanistan, have regime change in Iraq, and build up U.S. military presence in the Middle East to get control over their oil. But in 2000, September, when the PNAC report was issued, the authors were pretty prescient. They said, this is going to be a tough sell to the American public unless there is a catalyzing and catastrophic event like a new Pearl Harbor. Well, a year later, they got it, okay? So, yeah, that was geopolitical. That, there was that. You've got the insurance scam on the World Trade Center. That it was a monstrosity. They didn't know what to do with it. They couldn't tear it down. It was going to cost too much to try to renovate it. There was nothing they could do with it. What are they going to do with this? Well, okay, so you got that taken care of. You've got uh, you've got, you got Time Double Solar Eastern Constitution, the Institute of Homeland Security, which is rapidly becoming a national police force, something that has been resisted throughout our history, even by J. Edgar Hoover. He always fought against a national police force, you know? And now we got it. You've got all these restrictions now, now today. Uh, if you go to the Bahamas on vacation and you have an infant and you come back, that infant better have a passport or it doesn't get back in the United States. How's that for freedom? Okay? I mean, all of this stuff going on, the millions that have gone through Homeland Security, the billions that have gone through Halliburton and its subsidiaries and their, and their no-bid contracts, and in, in, in as far as Iraq goes, I've already, I think, talked to you all about the looting of the Iraqi National Museum and the fact that they wanted ET, ancient technology, and I think that's a big one. But there's also the oil, but it's not immediately discernible. Everybody said right away, well, we're actually going in there to get their oil. But the problem is, we haven't got their oil. There's less oil coming out of Iraq today than it was before we invaded because they keep blowing up the pipelines. 
okay? But here's what I found out. There has been virtually no oil exploration or new drilling in Iraq since the 70s because in the 80s they were in their war with Iran. In the 90s you had the first Gulf War. Then they're under restrictions. Nothing's been happening there. <clears throat> Out of the oil wells in Iraq, only three or four of them, a handful of them, are deeper than 5,000 feet. There are tremendous oil reserves deep underground and untapped in Iraq. Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, is about 90% depleted. They're starting to have to put, pump water into their uh, oil reservoirs to get enough pressure to get the oil out of the ground. And plus, uh, Saudi Arabia is very politically unstable. There is, they've had too much money for too long, too many people over there have gotten good educations, and they're not going for the... <coughs> For that Wahhabi brand of fundamental Muslimism anymore, they want to be more like Western. And I think the writing's on the wall that the control by the Sabat family is not going to last very much longer. So we're going to have to turn from Saudi Arabia, and where are we going to go? Iraq. And for those of you who hold out any hope that we will eventually pull out of Iraq, you can probably forget about it. We are building dozens of major military bases in Iraq. Billions are flowing in there to build this huge infrastructure in Iraq. Do you think we're just going to walk away from that? No, we want control over those vast oil reserves under Iraq. So we can see that this whole thing is multi-leveled, and it all benefits <clears throat> the globalist. And we haven't even mentioned Israel. If there's a country that has benefited from 9-11, it's Israel. And when you consider that Richard Pearl and Wolfowitz and a lot of these neocons hold dual citizenship with Israel, you begin to see that there is some subplots going on here, okay? Me personally, um, <clears throat> this is not an anti-Semitic rant. I, I, I love the Jewish faith, I love people of the Jewish faith, and a lot of my friends, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But we're talking about Zionism and the political movements that are going on, okay? And personally, I, th I think it should be against the law for someone to hold high public office in the United States who holds dual citizenship with another country. I've been to Israel. I have a high regard for Israel. I'm very much sympathetic to, in general, to, to their state, to their desire to be uh, defended, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's gotten god-awful in this country to the point to where you can't even question Zionist policy in Israel without being smeared as an anti-Semite. Well, I think I've just about worn out my welcome, but I just have to tell you that, uh, that I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. The warm welcome and the, the warm friendship that I felt here is just incredible. Uh, it's made me forget all about my cracked rib. <laughs> I mention that again because I've had too many people come up and try to give me a bear hug. <laughs> Please be careful, be gentle. Thank you all very much.